Okay. All right. So I think we're ready. Thank you for joining us. All right, let's get started. So thank you very much for joining us the day before the 4th of July. Uh, I know that some of you guys are outside of the United States and that's fantastic as well. Uh, but we're setting up these series of webcasts in case you're just joining us to talk about an actual attack. The way the attack goes from beginning all the way to the end, we're calling it attack tactics. And each session is broken up into two parts. The first part is discussing the actual attack methodology, talking about the different tools that were used, how they were used in conjunction with each other to successfully break into an organization or in some situations, organizations, because uh, we like to merge some of the pen tests together. The second webcast in that particular component is going to be the defensive component. So we're going to go through the actual attack that we went through. Then we're going to go to each step of that attack and we're going to discuss what are the defensive components an organization could have had in place to stop that specific phase of the attack so that's attack tactics it's brought to you by black hills information security and active countermeasures which is the two sides black hills information security is the offensive side and active countermeasures is the defensive side of our family here which honestly we should have like some superseding company above both an umbrella company i don't know what the hell that is we won't call it the umbrella corporation because that might <laughs> have some negative connotations associated with it. So let's get started with this webcast once I get my cursor back. There it is. It is also brought to you by Wild West Hackenfest of 2018. It is the absolute best security conference in the world, but I might be a little bit biased by that. Um, as I like to tell people- I think, if, I think you're right though. I, I, I think we are. And, and, and I, we also love our sister con, DerbyCon. No question. We say if you can get tickets for DerbyCon, go to DerbyCon, but then More again- More power to you, sir. Who can Man. get tickets to DerbyCon? Nobody. I mean, they sell out in like five seconds. And we still have tickets. Yeah, so, so, just so check it out. And we've got an amazing lineup. And we like to say, well, it's not even like to say we are the most hands on conference in the world. So check it out. Lots of cool stuff. Matt thought maybe your umbrella company should be called Alpha Better. Alpha Better? I like. <laughs> You can use the same color scheme as Alphabet. That would be good. It is also brought to you by SAN Security 504, um, also known as the greatest security class in the history of all security classes. Uh, can you hand me the dice and the books real quick? Uh, I'm going to be teaching Sansfire here at the end of the month, and anybody that attends Sansfire will get a free copy of the Active Countermeasures, the Art of Active Defense book, which um, has fewer typos uh, than the second You're the first edition. You're Sierra welcome. Sierra put a lot. Like you have no idea how much Sierra broke down into tears and was seriously thinking about <gasps> taking up a math addict addiction. It's really bad. <laughs> they're not that like, bad. They come to me and they're like, John, how do you cook meth? As though I'm the one in the company that knows how to do that, right? Um, never make it in the bathtub, boys and girls. Also, uh, you will receive these 20-sided dice. We have a cubicles and compromises lab in SAN Security 504 now. And you will get a free 20-sided dice. And they're so awesome. I don't know if you can see it in the camera, but it's got a logo for the one, so which is just cool. We rolled an 18. So it's going to be we a win. good webcast <laughs> today. Getting right into it. Disclaimer, uh, the attack that we're going to be going through in this webcast is true-ish. It's actually a mix of a large number of different types of attacks and pen tests that we did. We're trying very hard to stay away from this is an exact attack for this specific pen test. And there's a couple of reasons for that. The first reason is we have customers that tend to freak out whenever they watch these webcasts. And they're like, holy crap, that's us. And we have to tell them, Many times, no, it's just your organization is just like a lot of the other organizations. It turns out, out everybody there. is yeah. the same. You're not really a precious snowflake <laughs> at all. Um, so we try to blend it as well. So the names and screenshots are fake or pulled from BHIS blog posts or Google image searches. So if I have to look up like I, I got later, like a VMware management council, I just went to Google image search, pull that up, and pff, that's my screenshot. I'm not actually pulling from actual pen tests at all. So if you see anything with anything that looks like it's somebody's data, it's not from our, any of our customers. It's just something I, I Google image source um, and pulled it down. Um, and if you think this network, it looks like your network and you're like, he's talking about me. He's in my head. Uh, yeah, you're wrong. Well, possibly, because like we mentioned earlier, it's we see these exact same patterns showing up again and again and again. And when you're running a pen testing firm, there's a couple of different ways that you can run your firm. The one way that you can run your firm is you can make everything very stealthy. Like we have we have zero day exploits that no one else has, or we have our own back doors that we're, we're never going to share with the vendors or, or the techniques more often than not. Or we have um, 
specific methodologies that we'll never share with the community as a whole. If your pen testing company is doing that, they're jackasses and they shouldn't be doing that. The goal of a pen testing company is to make their customers better at what they do. And if they're holding a lot of things back from the community, they're only used in their very elite examples. Well, to be honest, that's not really making the community better as a whole. I mean, I understand helping customers. I get that. But the goal is to make it harder for us. And when we use the things in this webcast, what we're going through are these are the components and the tactics that we use again and again and again. And for the love of God, we want to stop using them and move on to other things. Because as the industry as a whole gets better, it makes us better, we get to do new tools and techniques, the testers are happy because they're not regurgitating the same crap again and again, life improves. And that's ultimately what we're after. So most organizations look like this, right? The attacker would be on the outside of the environment, you would have the cloud, which is the square icon that I have up there, or like Office 365, maybe some cloud services, but they would have a very solid domain infrastructure, right? They'd be running Active Directory, They'd have their domain controller. They'd have all kinds of servers in their DMZ. They'd have all the hosts in their network all connecting into the domain controller. And all the little systems would be snug behind the firewall and everything would be protected and wonderful. Um, that is not this organization, at least the organization that we're going to be discussing for this webcast. Instead, we're gonna be talking about a trend that we're starting to see especially with many hipster organizations. The whole Active Directory forest and setting up your organization with Active Directory seems to be, I guess, kind of anathema to the way a lot of newer organizations want to establish their IT infrastructure. A lot of newer organizations, they don't want to be tied to a specific building. They don't want to be tied to a specific network. They don't want to be behind firewalls. I mean, we have some customers, they just have offices that have open wireless access points that anyone can join, and then they access all of their resources in the cloud because absolutely everything is bring your own device. What could go wrong? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing at all could go wrong because the cloud is in use. So you have services like Slack, right? You'll be using Slack. Some organizations will try to use something like Mattermost on internal networks, but by and large, people use Slack. We tried to use it at Black Hills Information Security and my testers revolted and we're using Keybase instead. Uh, but they may use Google Apps, right, for email and documents. GitHub. Uh, for doing version control of their software. And they might have some type of cloud infrastructure, whether it's Amazon or Azure or DigitalOcean, they're putting all of their servers out in the cloud. So there really isn't this concept of a firewall, a DMZ, and you're putting all of your systems behind that firewall and that DMZ. Instead, all of your users are connected directly to the cloud and all of your users can access all of the services regardless of where they are. And I think that there's a couple of reasons why this is starting to happen. One, Active Directory, when you look at a computer security model like this, we are realizing doesn't really make organizations more secure by default. Uh, we talked about security models for years, having consolidated user ID and password requirements and it's all controlled over group policy. Group policy is gonna restrict access to files and folders. That would be nice if that's the way it worked. Instead, you have a lot of organizations that have weak passwords, no firewalls in between workstations. They have uh, shares with sensitive documents that are thrown out with everyone that's authenticated in the domain that has access to it. So from a security perspective, if you're a new CIO or a new CTO or even a new CSO, if you're looking at all of the stuff that's being done by organizations like SpectreOps, which is a fantastic sister pen testing organization, and just looking at what they do on a weekly basis to destroy the security models of Active Directory or Red Siege, um, which of course is Tim Adeen's company, and Kerberosting, it is really hard for a security executive to look at something like traditional Active Directory, establishing the organization moving forward and saying, yeah, let's do that. That seems like the way to handle things. So instead they go to new hotness. They try to use Google for a lot of their authentication. They try to lock things down via Google shares. And basically what they're doing is making a lot of the exact same mistakes. Instead, they're offsourcing a lot of their IT infrastructure to these third party organizations like Slack, Google, GitHub, and various cloud infrastructure providers. So I wanna pause for a couple seconds, breathe. Uh, so Sierra and BB, do we have any questions that need to be answered or nope. can I keep going? You can keep going. Well, oh, there's somebody that just popped up something, what's that? Uh, all yeah. of the AWS buckets that were public were very secure. Most of these are- just All of those buckets. AWS buckets were very secure. And I'm not gonna talk too much. Well, let's take a couple of seconds about that. Is that Rich? Uh, That's Brian. That's who? Brian. Brian did, okay. 
Um, so whenever you're talking about some of the things that are happening in the cloud, I'm not going to talk about us just scanning S3 buckets, finding S3 buckets of data and saying, oh, we found sensitive data. That's not what we're talking about this webcast. Uh, what we're talking about this webcast is a targeted attack. So you'll see some of those flavors, but we're going to talk about a targeted approach to going through it step by step by step. So we're going to use open source recon to find users, services, net blocks, vulnerabilities, and passwords. This is almost exactly like what we discussed in the previous webcast in the uh, attack tactics part one, where we're talking about the overall attack approaches using tools like Recon NG by Tim Tomes, uh, who wrote it while he was at Black Hills Information Security, and we still happily support it. I know BB has, uh, has contributed to Recon NG. And the reason why we support this product and this open source project so much is organizations don't understand just how dangerous open source recon can be whenever you're trying to attack an organization. Because we can literally identify users, services, network blocks, vulnerabilities, and passwords. So network blocks. Uh, recon NG does a great job for identifying the network blocks. And there's a number of ways you can do this in Recon NG. One, you can enumerate hosts, identify the IP addresses, and then enumerate the network blocks from there. Um, the other thing that you can use is tools like Shodan. I wanted to mix, or not Shodan, Multego. I wanted to mix things up a little bit. We talked about Recon NG in the first session. Now in the third, I want to talk about another tool that can be used for Recon. We're going to be discussing um, uh, Multego. Now Multego is interesting because you can put in a domain and you can perform a number of transforms and identify users, you can identify groups, you can identify web servers, and you can identify network blocks. Now, what we're looking for is predominantly target expansion. If you have an IP address, it's in a network block or a network range, and that network range is like a neighborhood. And a customer may own a neighborhood of IP addresses, like a slash 24 um, or slash 16, you know, for using classless interdomain routing. You see things like 255.255.0.0. That would be a slash 16. Uh, that would mean that the lower two uh, orders of the subnet mask are associated for the network. And we're trying to identify what are the ranges, because if you have a web server in a network range, there could be hundreds of additional other services like VPNs that are also within that network range. So we enumerate those network blocks to identify things of interest. Also within those network ranges, we can use tools like eyewitness. Okay. It's um, just Derek pointed out that the O365 Magic Unicorn tool is a new thing. It's not our thing, it's a new thing, it's cool. Um, it uses a previously undocumented API. It's useful for forensics. Thank you, Derek, for pointing That's that fantastic. out. Fantastic. Try to give credit as much as credit is due. <laughs> We're still waiting for John to sing. You know what? We're still waiting for you to sing. <laughs> waiting for Justin Bieber. Is it too Bieber. late to say sorry? Oh my gosh, you guys. I'm not gonna sing the rest of it because that's just weird to sing to a bunch of <sighs> IT people. Because I'm missing. And out. also. Um, a few of you have said that I don't email you enough, so I'll try to email you more. Um, and then we have some people that are just like, could you just email me personally once a day? And I'm like, no, I can't do that. I know you get those emails too. No, like, I do try to respond to everybody. But um, if you want to be, we do have like the RSS feed to our blog. You can subscribe to just our blog and then get updates when we release we stuff. We email so, you all the time. So. Yeah. All right, so moving on. Uh, so eyewitness. Now in this particular assessment, uh, we identified a network range. And in that network range, you can use a tool like eyewitness uh, that will go through and it'll identify all of the web servers. And it can use that as an import from like a, a MMAP file, excuse me, for specific ports. Now what we're looking for our web portals. Uh, you'll be looking for things like Apache Tomcat servers or F5 firewall load balancer logins or default pages or uh, Citrix terminals, whatever. You're going to find a number of different services that you wouldn't normally identify just by simply going to an organization's website. This is why we find that one IP address for the website and then we expand out on that network range to look at the other services that are around that specific network range, because that's where you start to find the interesting things associated with an organization. In this example, we found a couple of different things. We found VMware management interfaces um, that you couldn't access directly, but they were there. 
And you're also able to identify additional other services that could be attacked. Now, in most organizations, when they have cloud infrastructure, they're going to have some IP addresses that are in the cloud infrastructure, but they're also going to have services that are in a service provider in the cloud. There's a difference between the two. So you would have Azure, they'd have a network range of services that they stand up specifically for their organization or Amazon or DigitalOcean. In addition to that, they're gonna be using cloud services like Google Apps for their email and for their documents, or they might be using GitHub for versioning control of their source code, right? Or they might be using Slack and so on. So you'd have these different services and you're really gonna be starting to look at a mix of a number of additional locations. So we're trying to expand the total attackable surface by using tools like Eyewitness. Yes, uh, um, questions. Chris, Chris Bratton had more of a comment, but I just wanted to- Yeah, read yeah. Because Chris Bratton's He's awesome. Chris Bratton. Um, he says, in my humble opinion, when people talk about whether cloud security is any good, the comparison is made like keeping things internal creates perfect security. Nothing could be further from the truth. Sometimes cloud security is not perfect, but it's still better than what most organizations can do on their own. Also, outsourcing a portion of security requirements means that they can focus more on what's still internal. I would agree with that. I would agree with that. But there's a, a kind of like one more step caveat that I think is a concern is you have organizations that they don't know very much about IT infrastructure. And if they throw everything out in the cloud, they're apt to make the exact same mistakes. Regardless of what you do, there has to be an education component. Um, education. Education is huge, right? There has to be an education component. You can't just simply outsource because it's hard. You've got to be able to understand what you're doing. Now, to Chris's point, which I agree with 110%, is if Black Hills Information Security said, you know what? Let's stop using Google. Let's stand up our own email server. Because we are sort of a cloud-based company. There are so many additional ways to shoot yourself in the foot <laughs> whenever you try to stand up your own IT infrastructure. And when you go with a cloud provider, they take a lot of those things off the table, but you can still shoot yourself in the foot. Sure, there's always uh, that option. Always. So now we can also look at network ranges and look at network blocks with additional tools like Shodan. Whereas Eyewitness is going to identify the different web portals that are available. And like port 443, port 80, port 8080, or port 8888, or whatever. You're going to find all of these different web services and these web pages. But that's not all the services that can exist within that specific range. We can also use tools like Shodan to identify databases, to identify services like Telnet, uh, to identify management interfaces that we may have missed with Eyewitness that or things like different IP webcams that possibly didn't show up in our original NMAP scan that we're running or a Nessus scan or whatever scan it is that you're using to try to identify the attackable surface. Now, I wanted to give a couple of moments. There's been some comments lately on, on Twitter where people come up and say that if you're using Nessus for a penetration test, you're not a penetration tester. Those people are wrong, um, absolutely completely wrong. It, Whenever you're approaching a red team or a penetration test, you're going to try to use any and all the tools that are available that your customer will agree to allow you to use. If you're going to use Nmap, absolutely, you can use Nmap. If you want to use Nessus, great, that's fantastic, as long as it's something the customer agrees to. When we use these tools, we will absolutely use scanning tools like Eyewitness, like Nmap, like Nessus. But based on the type of assessment, we will change how we will go about using those tools. Sometimes you may scan directly from BHIS IP addresses. We have customers all the time that want to know exactly where we're coming from. They're requiring that scan for PCI requirements. So we have to do the full scan and it's full coordination. And that's great. That's fantastic. Then we have some customers that are actively trying to stop us while we're attacking them. That's fine too. You set all of that up with your scope and your rules of engagement with your customer. With some customers, we don't want to scan them directly. With some customers, we're going to use tools like Shodan that'll scan those ranges for us before we even get there. And then we'll do analysis on the results that Shodan had with that specific network range associated with the target organization. So I thought we had questions. We um, David, well, I think you kind of just answered this, but David said, when a company CEO gets permissions to pen test, does that permission allow scanning of BYOD? of employees, what if they are contractors? Oh, that's uh, extremely difficult. So generally, as a rule, a, a customer cannot give you permission to scan other people's devices that are bring your own device. Because they're personal. Because they're personal, absolutely. So on the bottom of our computers, we have Black Hills Information Security stickers. We need to know that this is an actual asset of the company. 
And whenever we hire like Kevin Johnson from Secure Ideas to do a pen test or uh, Dave Kennedy from TrustedSec to do a pen test against us, the, they're going to be attacking BHIS resources. And because they're really good companies at what they do, they will make sure that before they actually target someone at the company, like for instance, Sierra, uh, they'll make sure with who, who, would, target who would ever target Sierra uh, <laughs> would be a bad Marketing is ironclad. Such a bad idea. Um, <laughs> I've even told people, don't, don't target. No, and no, we're going do. after Sierra. Don't, no, she's God, in marketing. no. Although she's on webcasts every week about how attacks work. But these are I assets that we <laughs> own. You know, these are assets that we own. And if I attack someone else's asset and I don't have permission, even if you try to give me permission, you're like, yeah, go ahead and attack my husband's computer. No, that's not going to fly more than likely. That's just wrong. We it's cannot illegal. do that. And it's illegal. And prison sucks. Yeah, I mean, the sticker. Oh, prison sucks. Remember, choose wisely. choose wisely. Choose wisely. So it all depends on what the customer is trying to get out of the assessment. Uh, do they want a full scan? Do they want to have that full visibility? Or do they want us to come in stealthy? That's up to the customer and it's up to the engagement and what they're looking for. The other things that a lot of people don't know much about sh images, uh, .shodan.io is so incredibly creepy. You can also use this with the exact same network modifier on this slide where we're talking about Shodan. You can put that network modifier and then you can try to identify any services like VNC, remote desktop, webcams that may exist. It's very, very, very similar to something like Eyewitness, except it's also looking at additional services. And many of those services overlap with Chris's tool. Eyewitness will do a lot of this. But once again, the difference is between having somebody like Shodan do the scan before you get there, or Eyewitness is where you're actively running that scan um, from your own computer systems. How you approach it will be different from customer to customer. And this was just a default images.shodan.io a scan that I ran through. And you gotta be careful with Shodan, just straight up going to images.shodan.io because some people have their computers exposed to the open internet, like the over VNC, and they're surfing very, very <sighs> naughty things online, like Justin Bieber videos. All right, now I wanna identify users. This is something we didn't talk about very much in the previous webcast series. Uh, we talked about being able to pull that down from LinkedIn. But I wanted to talk about a specific blog post uh, that uh, Kerry Roberts put together. And Kerry went through and talked about how you can use Google and Burp together to basically scrape the users that Google identifies at something like LinkedIn. You don't wanna go directly to LinkedIn and try to scrape because that tends to have issues. In fact, BB, isn't that module currently broken in uh, Recon NG? I don't even think it works anymore uh, with, with it, LinkedIn. Or at it least is. I, know, I don't think LinkedIn's giving the API keys anymore either. Yeah, it is broken. It takes it takes. We we actually search through um, uh, Bing, Bing the search engine. Uh, so we're not hitting Bing. not hitting LinkedIn directly. Um, and even that one is is unreliable. This thing changes very very frequently. Somebody said Bing's not reliable. Sorry, I, I have to rip on Bing any chance that I can get. <laughs> Bing is awesome. You know what I think is funny about Bing is that they've tried so hard to put themselves into movies and TV shows. Yeah, I love it whenever you have people on TV shows who are like, hey, could you Bing that real quick? Yep. And immediately people are like, nobody says that. <laughs> nobody ever says that. <laughs> um, so, BB, if we're ever doing a webcast together, we're going to have to do something on, we should do a webcast on stop hating and learn to love Bing, uh, like <laughs> IP hosts. And there's a bunch of cool things that you can do with Bing. Um, but honestly, Bing... <laughs> like all the things that Google's been shutting down over the years and making it harder and harder and harder to do, it seems like Bing allows that because they're just happy anyone's using it. <laughs> yeah, it's a bunch of pen testers and hackers using our service, but hey, we're getting usage and that's awesome. You never know, it might win in the end. Yeah, and uh, are you are, are you still using the Python scripter uh, very much in your tests, Baby? Yeah, I, I use that. Um, I think it's we've changed it a bit since the version that Carrie wrote because the results come back differently over time. But yeah, it's it's still fantastic. It's it's awesome. And if you if you're at all interested in Burp extensions, this is a great way to figure out how to do them without having to go through all the painful steps. This is this is a great illustration and it's actually useful for still pulling out people. And you know, with these with these different scripts and these extensions, like you said, it changes. Like from the time this particular blog post was written, it's changed. I would say probably at least once a month, somebody on the team says, this has changed, it's now broken, we're modifying it now to make it work again. Would that be a, a fair assessment? Yeah, yep. 
So it's not that the stuff is broken. It's just that it's always breaking and you're constantly fixing it and modifying. It. So this is a way that you can use Google to basically scrape results from something like LinkedIn. Because if you go directly to LinkedIn, they don't like that. Bad guys don't, don't do that. I don't even think my API key works anymore. Does it, Bibi? I I haven't I haven't tried it. I don't know. Yeah, because for a while we were just using my API key, and that started making me a little bit nervous. Um, because everyone's like, "Can I get John's API key?" And I'm like, "I'm pretty sure that's violating a terms of service." Because you know me in terms of service, I always abide by them. <laughs> All right. So, the next tool is called Cred King. God, I just fixed this image. It's um, a little fuzzy. It's a little fuzzy. Uh, so we'll me, try to make it better in the recording. This is just yeah. We'll we'll fix it in post. Brianna's that's like, right. God, why me? But now we have our intern. We have an intern. He just looks like he died inside a little Specifically bit. Specifically for a video. Uh, just 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 a little bit. Um, I've got another. Gonna be awesome. We can do this. We can do this. We've got we've got solutions. You don't uh, have to do it right now. I can. I don't Move have to change along. it right now. He's so um, this is from this presentation that uh, you stay ready. Mike Felch and Bo Bullock, uh, Daft Hack did. And we're going to talk about this. This is a, a really nice image of that because I have that actual screenshot here. Now let's talk about password spraying cloud services in terms of service. All right. This is something Dave Kennedy and I, I think are giving a presentation on at DerbyCon. Uh, we've been talking about it, bouncing it back and forth. But there's been a lot of people discussing that penetration testing is dead or a handful of people that are very noisy about it. And they're full of crap and that's wrong. But um, the idea of pen testing mo modifying itself over the next five to 10 years and evolving is absolutely true. One of the problems that we're going to start running into more and more whenever we're talking about cloud services or Active Directory is not in play is trying to do direct password spring against a service like let's say Google Apps kind of makes Google mad. And speaking from some more or less direct experience with this. What? If you attack Google you directly, about? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you attack Google Shh, directly, don't say that word out loud. Yeah. if you attack Alphabet er. Er, <laughs> directly, there is a strong possibility that they will block your Google account if you're trying to spray from a Google that account. That could be bad for us. There's also a strong possibility they'll identify all of the other Google accounts at your address or IP address and also block those accounts and start shutting down the domains associated with that attack. And that's a bad day. Now, there's multiple problems with this. The first problem is directly shutting down entire domains. I can understand where they're coming from. They're trying to stop the attack, right? That's their number one goal. Contain. Contain it, right? Contain, clear, move on. However, this will stifle any security research and it'll fundamentally <laughs> change the way penetration testing is happening. Because if I'm attacking from a BHIS resource against a paying customer, it's completely up to Google to shut my entire domain down. And that can create a tremendous amount of problems. So what Mike did uh, at You Stay Ready on Twitter, what he did is he wrote a tool called Cred King. Um, and what Cred King does is it allows you to do password spraying, but you don't do it from like your Google account from your own IP address. You spin it up from Amazon EC2 and you spin up a number of Amazon Lambda instances. Now, Amazon Lambda allows you to run a series of programs in Amazon. You're not running a full computer. You're simply running your script inside of Amazon. So what you're basically doing is you're taking the cloud providers and you're turning them against each other. So you have Amazon password spraying Google. Now, in that scenario, Google is far less likely to be able to identify the attack. They're also far less likely to unilaterally black block Amazon IP addresses because that could impact their services as well. Now, is this going to continue working on into the future? I don't know. Uh, maybe. Uh, is this violating some terms of service? Yeah, that's a very strong possibility that it's doing that. But you love is, terms of service. Huh? You love terms we of service. We do love terms of service. We absolutely violate terms of service every single day what we do as part of our jobs. But remember, the difference between going to jail and not going to jail is permission. We have permission from our customers. So now we get into a debate of what are, whether we have permission from the customers and the third-party service provider whose answer is to always say no to penetration tests. Basically what I'm getting at is things are gonna get interesting, really, really interesting. But if you wanna test your credentials against a Google application, you can use a tool like Gred King to basically allow you to do a password spray against your organization to look for weak passwords like spring 2018. Right, which is one of our all-time favorite passwords. Actually, is that on the shirt? No, it's not, not on this that one. one. No, it's on one of our shirts. You yeah. see it all the time. Now, we got skunked in this particular test. User ID, passwords, 
spraying wasn't work. Now, the reason why is this is one of those rare organizations that actually had two-factor enabled. I can't remember what the total percentage of accounts that have two-factor enabled are on, on Google, but the number is laughably low. You need to enable two-factor in your organization. We aren't talking about defenses in this webcast, but it will actually skunk us quite a bit at the time from a simple password spray. And to be completely honest, your adversaries, the real bad guys, not Black Hills Information Security or um, Layers or any of those organizations, the real adversaries are password spraying all of the time. So it wouldn't make any sense for us as testing firms not to do that if we know the adversaries are doing this. So how do we get past that? If we have two-factor authentication enabled, how do we bypass that? Well, let's talk about attacking Google two-factor authentication. And this is, again, coming from a presentation that was given by uh, You Stay Ready and DAFTACT. There they are right there in their natural environment from that closet. <laughs> and this walks through the overall approach um, that uh, Cred Sniper uses to gain access to accounts. Now, it's interesting. I, Cred Sniper, I think, is one of those absolutely incredibly important tools that's been released over the past couple of years because it allows you to attack successfully two-factor authentication within an, like a Google Apps domain. And I think the reason why is, is it hasn't quite taken off to the point where you're seeing people writing about it all the time is the concept of it isn't as simple as like point at Google, run this command, magic happens. You have a lot of setup that you need to do. So if we're going through this like step by step, to attack an organization, we would usually inject the calendar event in their calendar. Now, they did a presentation at Wild West Hack and Fest in 2017, uh, which was a Google event to remember, a Google event you'll never forget. And they talked about this entire attack methodology and how it actually works. You can inject a calendar invite into somebody's calendar without them ever acknowledging it. It just basically shows up and injects it right into the calendar. We had notified Google of this problem and Google said they're not going to bother fixing it at all. Uh, Mike has this email from Google saying, yeah, we're not gonna fix it. So you can inject calendar like notifications directly into somebody's calendar using Google. Now that person will receive a reminder saying, hey, you have a meeting, it's starting in half an hour, HR reports or this HR violation or whatever. You're going to have some type of meeting that's going to be really important for somebody to click that link. Brian says, but BHS is always asking us for, to add ourselves to their calendar invites. Yes, but that's different. <laughs> okay, that's... It's the same. He's got us. That's, he's got us there. But what we're not doing is... We're, they're malicious. They're not malicious. They're, they're webcast links. They're webcast links. <laughs> What could be wrong? What could be wrong with that? But we could if we wanted to, but we don't because we're a good company. All right. So then you, in step three, you're going to get a fish address. So someone's going to have something in that calendar invite that's going to say, click this link. Now you click that link and you go to a phishing website. Once you are at that phishing website, it's going to fetch your profile image from Picasa. So if you have a picture associated with your Why account, you have both. it's going to pull it. Now, the interesting thing that they found in their research is Google only does this successfully on their own, like half the time. So it either has the default image, which is just a silhouette, or it's your real picture that you have. But we're going to populate that so it looks like an authentication request from Google. Now, you're going to put in your password. Now, whenever you put in your password, you can see it kind of splits right here, right? You put in the password and we have, basically, it's gonna to check to see if you have two-factor enabled. If you do have two-factor enabled, it's going to go on your behalf, it's going to try to authenticate to Google and it's going to intercept your two-factor authentication. Now, in their full long presentation, they have a full explanation of the number of different types of two-factor that can be used. It could be U2FA, it could be the Google Authenticator app, it can be a text message, it can be a number of different ways, and they talk about ways to intercept that and pull that data down. Now, where this gets really, really, really interesting for the attacker is once we have a two-factor authentication code, a user ID, and a password, they can then access Google directly. They can generate an application password, so then they can continue to gain access to your Google app domain, and then they can start pulling any data that they want off of that domain. So this is how you would go about attacking Google two-factor authentication. And to be sure, the exact same type of technique can be used for Office 365 as well. So CredSniper has the capability to set up all of this and walk you through it. 
And Bo and Mike have done a number of presentations on how to set this up effectively. And this has been incredibly successful for Black Hills Information Security in gaining access to organizations that have two-factor authentication enabled. So go get Cred Sniper right now. As I said, it'll automatically fetch the profile image. It asks nicely for the passwords behind the scenes. It'll do the authentication. If two factors enabled, it'll actually steal that token and then allow that service to then authenticate, create an app password so that you can continue accessing that Google app account. It, it, and not just for that one specific fish scenario, but continuing to move it again and again and again. So do we have any questions on this so far? And by the way, I put a link down to the full slide deck that Daft Hack and You Stay Ready did, where they were talking about, okay, Google, how do I red team G Suite? So any questions or comments? Um, I'm typing that, that link in, so it's live, Daft Hack. Um, we had one question, it's kind of off topic, but what did you make that slide before? Go back. Go <laughs> Sorry, back, go joking. Back. Go, back. go back. This one? Yeah. Did you make that slide? No, this was actually made by Bo and uh, mm. and Mike. Forward. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay. Google dash how mm. do I red team G Suite? There you go. It's in the chat. It's live. Um, uh, Carlos says he loves everything you're saying and thank you very much for your time. We're happy to help. And uh, okay, cool. All right, now I've got to warn you. Um, this is something that's kind of a bit, ha! bit of a letdown. Tobias says you keep sending off his Google Home. Well, why do you have that at Google Home, Tobias? <laughs> Shh. <laughs> um, the one concern that I have about this is we have talked to Google about these issues and Google has decided not to fix these issues. They're kind of taking the default Microsoft approach whenever we talked about attacking this Outlook web access, thing. this calendar injection okay. thing. They're like, yeah, we're not going to fix it. And whenever we get to the next session of this particular series, which is I think in a few weeks, right? Um, uh, yes, at the end of the month. At the end of the month. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I don't know what to say for defense on this because it's not an issue of just enabling two-factor authentication because we can get past that. It's not an issue of enabling U2FA where you have a UB key. You don't have your UB key on you, do you? Um, where you require a physical device like a UB key because Mike and Bo can bypass that. This is a problem, right? Because this can consistently be attacked. And Google's take on a lot of this is if an attacker has your user ID, your password, and your token, you're hosed. But they're not really doing all they can to try to defend against it, in our in our opinions, and they can definitely do better. So we'll be talking more about defenses later on this month. Uh, Brian asks, honey accounts? Honey accounts? I think honey accounts would be okay. Uh, you'd have to make them exposed in some kind of fashion or another. And the other thing about honey accounts, I love honey accounts. I think it's a great idea, but you're going to spend a lot of time because there's a lot of crap that comes through. Now, the fish that you got today, that was a good one. I think I might talk about that. I don't want to bring it up now. But what did they reflect this actual event back to you? And try I to get you to don't even know. It just looked so suspicious that I just screamed yeah. bloody murder but and it was, sent it to you guys. It was completely tied to this specific webcast that we are doing right now. And they were trying to get Sierra to click a link. How do you differentiate something like that that definitely looks like a targeted attack and your standard mortgage refinance crap that people get all the time. You spend a lot of time basically researching the that attacks. Was, that was the high level fish that was versus level. just like everybody anywhere. Yeah, that was I'm definitely targeted at prince. you. There's no question that was targeted <laughs> at you, uh, but it made it through. So let's talk about those fishing ruses. You gotta be evil. And this also goes back to these emphatics that you have, um, or absolutes that people try to create in penetration testing. Like, if you do this, you're not a real pen tester. Well, that's garbage. Um, I've been here almost since the beginning of pen testing. I've got a pretty good idea what it actually is. And when we start saying these absolute boundaries exist on these things, yeah, you're wrong. Um, because customers will constantly be modifying what you're allowed to do. The calendar injection is just scary. It works very, pink very, very teaming. well. Pink teaming. What pink teaming, right? <laughs> HR violation, right? This is one that we tried to set up with a customer. We're going to send in a phishing ruse, highly targeted ruse, that said that that person was accused of an HR violation. Here's the link with the full write-up of the HR violation. That's pretty juicy. You you would click that, right? I mean, <laughs> I, <laughs> no one likes to hear that they're part of an HR violation at all. Salary updates. Oh, it's not supposed to go to me. Like, I, you know, so, hey, I sent something to Erica. Hey, Erica, here's the next round of salary updates. I accidentally CC Sierra. Is she going to open that? No, she's not because I'm she's not. a damn great employee. <laughs> but anybody who's not Sierra probably would, right? You know, you kind of want to look at that data. 
Um, targeted attacks using friends and family and hobbies, car loan or home loan changes, overdraft notices. That one actually works pretty well. Uh, saying that you've overdrafted your account, please click here immediately uh, to take, ah, people click on that. And this really depends on what the customer will allow you to do. Um, BB, I, just, to, just out of curiosity, how often does a customer, when you're talking about a spear phishing ruse, say, whoa, 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 back off. Let's not go <laughs> with that one. Let's go with the UPS shipment notification instead. It, it's as often as not. The bigger places tend to be the ones that do that more. The, no, no, I don't want to talk to the HR people. We don't want to get in trouble. Make it a nice fish. Make it a nice fish. Don't offend anybody, right? Right. Um, yeah. I, I've talked about it before. I think my favorite fish, and BB, I don't know if you were on this assessment. Um, we saw that the company had done like a 10K. They had sponsored a 10K walk run for it was like a volks march or something like that and there was like four other sponsors and one of them was like a shoe company so we sent in a fish from the shoe company saying thank you for co-sponsoring this event here's a voucher for 50 percent off of our shoes on our website and we got amazing click-throughs um hr freaked out the company that was the shoe company freaked out and the customers like the people that we fish freaked out and after we explained everything to everybody what we did we even misspelled the company's name because that's kind of my thing right that's my calling card <laughs> i misspelled something um we still had the customers in a meeting where we sat down and explained the fish how you could have detected the fish i still had customers the people that we fished say wait a minute so we're not getting 50 percent off of shoes could you clarify that for me <laughs> It's like, no, that's not what this was. Why would you do that to us? Uh, but it had a tremendous click through rate. So a lot of times customers will push that back against us. Like you said, about 50-50. Everyone is suggesting their own favorite fishes, including Collect pay those. Collect pay those. We PayPal, want them. IRS, fake pay Apple email. Okay, don't ever do the IRS, okay? Uh, don't, <laughs> don't impersonate don't, a government Don't impersonate official. a government agency. Uh, we did impersonation. Ask Tomes the story. Uh, if you're ever at a conference with him, Tim impersonated the IRS to get people to download a file. Ah! Like we need to update everyone's W-2 or I-9 or whatever. And we had a fake IRS phishing website where people would go and download the documents. It takes the IRS roughly 24 hours to find that. 24 hours? I thought it would be like 24 no, minutes. It's within like 24 hours they oh, find it. I oh. swear to God. And well, they, they, were ready, are, they, they were ready to shut us down. They were calling it law enforcement. The only reason why we are still here as a company is I had someone from the IRS in my SANS class in San Diego while it was happening who was able to get them to back off and saying, no, this is legitimate. He's being paid to do this. It's okay. And they were basically like, well, don't ever do that. Again. I mean, it's good to know the IRS is on it because there are so many IRS scams. So, I mean, yeah, absolutely. They're paying right? attention. They are. They are. But don't use IRS, okay? It's 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 bad. Um, and then once you have access to somebody's drive, it's game on. Uh, so in this example, I just did a search for passwords and found a bunch of documents that I created in this fictitious account. Uh, passwords are secure, critical network diagrams, and of course, my security staffing survey that I didn't clean up off of my slide. But now you're just looking for documents like you would normally, right? You can just go through and you can search through and you can pull the documents down. Now, this is something that happened in one of our tests, and this actually happens a lot more than it honestly should. So once you gain access to someone's email, you are basically that person, right? So if anybody has two-factor, uh, not two-factor, if they're using like authentication where you use multi-factor with the Google, and then they're basically sharing that single sign-on with Google, you can then access everything else that that organization or that individual has. So in this example uh, that I went through and I recreated, the firewall password is not working. This actually came from one of our tests where we were able to gain access to a GitHub repository, a private GitHub repository, and you could search for a password within the repository, and you would literally find passwords in their source code. Um, and in the example that I created, it said, did someone change the password for the firewall? I tried super secret password 1234, and it did not work. If it changed it, change it back, right? <laughs> um, so now I, I have this password for the firewall. And we talked about earlier how we went through and we used that net block analysis to identify additional services. We had like an F5 firewall or DigitalOcean has their own firewall or a Linux-based firewall. Now you can go in and you can just change the firewall rules. Right, so if we have a number of firewall rules that allow access, and I just threw a bunch of crap firewall rules in that are restricting access to a specific service someplace, you could just do IP table space minus flush. Uh, don't do that, I was joking. Uh, some people will get that, other people will run that on their firewall. Be like, what does that do to my firewall rules? It flushes them, don't do that. 
Or better yet, what you can do is you can add in a specific rule that will allow the tester to gain access to a sensitive resource. Um, and in this particular example, once we gained access to the firewall, we were then able to gain access to sensitive res resources like vSphere. Um, and yes, this is not real. This is from a Google image search. I just want to make sure that everyone knows that because people will be like, oh my God, he's <laughs> leaking data from nku.edu. No, no, no. This was a Google search uh, going through a vSphere client. I think it came from one of their documents on how to use vSphere, vSphere client, but it was just a simple Google image search. Now you have access to the entire organization, right? You've gotten access to their Google account. You've accessed their sensitive documents. You've found passwords. You've gone in and modified their security settings. And now you've accessed their critical resources and actually their entire server farm that is up in the cloud. So this kind of ties together how you can gain access to an environment without ever using Active Directory, right? You're just basically trying to attack that organization using those cloud services. So the takeaways for this are pen testing is changing and dealing with the changes was always our job. The reason why we continue to have employment as penetration testers is because security is not a static game. If it was completely static, you'd be able to create a magic tool it would scan and automatically fix your environment, but it's not. The services are constantly evolving. Um, the applications that we're attacking are constantly changing and we're moving things around, redoing things, making the exact same mistakes again and again and again. And cloud services hate pen testers because we get up and we give presentations about how to attack their service. And their life is a lot easier if they can have all of their customers believe that they are completely and utterly secure behind the loving arms of Azure <laughs> or Google. You can still make mistakes, right? You can still make mistakes. And that's why we are here. We're going through and we're doing that type of analysis. Now, in the future at some point, do I believe pen testing is going to go away? Yeah, by and large. I think a huge percentage of pen testing in the next 25, 30 years is going to evaporate. You're still going to have pen testers that are going to do product-specific assessments, API-specific assessments. But a lot of the architecture stuff, I would like to think, is stabilized. Now, that's just a pipe dream, right? That's me looking at a crystal ball, looking forward in the future 25 years, and there's a 99.9% .9 chance that I'm horribly, horribly wrong. But as testers, if we do not evolve, we are not going to be relevant anymore. We're gonna be automated out of jobs. So we need to be able to evolve as an organization. And we still need to test, right? We're still finding issues. And to be honest, we're not even really looking that hard at some of these services. Some of these services that we've gone through some of the tools that we wrote by Mike and Bo, that's a pen test, one pen test that they were able to come up with attacking that specific service. And when you look at services like Google Apps and the authentication portion of Google, that's something that everyone should be looking at. Now, think about how many additional services Amazon releases per month, and are all of those completely secured and locked down? Okay, let's say they might be today. Will they be a month from now, two months from now, a year from now? You won't know until these things are tested. And unfortunately, it's going to be very, very, very difficult to continue doing that testing moving forward unless we come up with a better approach at working with the cloud providers. So it, lack of Active Directory doesn't make you secure. Having Active Directory doesn't make you secure. If you decide to go with the cloud, a number of things, a number of ways to shoot yourself in the foot are taken away. They take care of a lot of those things, patching and updating. That's great and that's awesome, but you can still be compromised. Once again, we have to practice due diligence and exercise caution. And in our next webcast, we're gonna go through this exact same attack, but now in that particular webcast, we're gonna go through and we're gonna talk about the defenses that an organization could have had in place to stop every phase of the attack. Once again, this webcast is brought to you by Black Hills Information Security and Active Countermeasures. Um, check out our product, AI Hunter. Um, our goal in making this particular product is taking this, bringing fire down from the mountain. Uh, Chris Brenton is on this webcast. He's the guy that pretty much runs everything day to day for Active Countermeasures. And we wanted to be able to take the idea of hunting away from a bunch of people that know, said, and awk and bash at a level that frightens everybody to the point where an analyst can sit down that doesn't understand packet header level details and they can get actionable intelligence very, very, very quickly. So check out AI Hunter. Um, and if you're worried about cost, seriously, the cost of our product is less than the sales tax for a lot of the other products that do this type of stuff. So please check it out. If you want a demo, Chris and I love talking about the product. We'd be happy to do a demo. Also, Brian said that the interview you did on Security Weekly recently was really awesome. That's great. Yeah, so. that was a fun interview. That was a really fun interview. 
Um, also, want to finally say thank you, and then we'll open it up to questions. Uh, I'm John Strand, Black Hills Information Security, Active Countermeasures, Sand Security Weekly, INS. Dear God, I need a help. Uh, I need some help. I need a break now. Like I said, I need a jacket that's like a NASCAR driver jacket that has patches <laughs> for every organization that I support and work with. So let's bring in some questions here in the last few minutes of this webcast. And um, we really didn't have any questions. If you have questions, uh, okay, Matthew says, John mentioned key base offhand earlier. I'd love to hear more about that sometime. Uh, BB, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but we were looking at Slack uh, for trying to talk about group chat for Black Hills Information Security. And our major concern was uh, the lack of encryption. And I think that there were some security vulnerabilities that popped up in Slack a little bit. We decided to go to key base because of end-to-end -end encryption. And it appeared to be a more secure platform for us to be able to chat with. Uh, is that kind of your take on it, BB? Yeah, the Keybase is end to end, and it's not like um, so. There's not they're not as in the middle of things as Slack is. There's not this huge archive of all your stuff on some system that you don't have control over or access to. Um, yeah, Keybase is pretty cool. Yeah, they update. I think that they update like every other day. <laughs> you get a Keybase pop up. They're like, hey, there's a new update. Um, that's a little bit annoying, but uh, but no, at least we know someone's on top of things. Yes. Uh, John says, so is there a defense for the G Suite 2FA thing? bypass that we talked about yeah we'll we'll, we'll talk huh? about that uh, <laughs> uh later. let's talk about that on maybe the next by podcast. the end of july there will be some good information maybe. Maybe. Okay. i think we're gonna have to get mike and bo on for defenses against that <laughs> because mike gets really fired up of that uh derek said that he thought slack was pretty owned <laughs> uh yes uh it's so it looks like that is pretty okay. Bradley said, what about third party authentication gateways for managing these centrally, such as Okta with 2FA? Did, Okta? Yeah, that's a it's to, a single sign-on solution like ping. To centralize the administration and monitoring of authentication. Yes, we are going to be talking about the centralization of that of that monitoring and that authentication. But the problem with a lot of that two-factor authentication, you run into the exact same issue again and again and again. If I can intercept and get in the middle of that two-factor authentication and serve as a proxy to forward the authentication, it allows me to intercept that two-factor code or that two-factor authentication in the middle of that communication stream. And with the U2FA bypass, I'm pretty sure it still works, not 100%. Um, but the way to bypass the U2FA side of it was basically tell the authenticating service that you're like an iPad. And it says, well, you can't support U2FA, so we're just basically going to shut it off so you can authenticate directly. Yes, those services help, especially whenever you kind of incorporate with an overall CASB solution. That can be monitoring access, can monitoring for multiple concurrent logins. It can be monitoring for abuse of access, like searching for files across an entire organization. It's basically we're now trying to incorporate the defenses um, that we never really got in place in Active Directory as far as file and uh, file sharing on uh, an Active Directory as well. So we'll talk more about CASBs and two-factor authentication and how that works in the cloud in the next session. Okay. Well, looks good. Um... That's it. All right. Well, thank you so much, everybody. We will see oh, you. Oh, wait, wait. Are we supposed to do something? Yes, we are. Oh, yes. Uh, phones. Bree reminded me that we have. We'll be raffling off Sarah's cell phone. What? No. <laughs> no. We have the drawings. We have the drawings. Okay. So the winner for the book, the book, the full color signed. I'll have him sign it right now and send it to you. It's Tom Curry. Uh, Tom Curry, are you on? Yeah. The people online said, wait, wait. The drawing. We need the shirt, the T-shirt, and the book. Who wins the book? Tom Curry. Are you there? I don't know if you're there. If you don't message me. You're Please respond in chat, it. Tom. Oh, you Curry. are. Okay, email me, Sierra at bhs.co. Please don't fish me because I'm so tired of being so aware. Only if we can fish you says. back. Okay, and then we'll give a T-shirt to Dan Flynn. Dan Flynn. Can we throw in some dice for these guys as well? Yes, that's the next thing I'm giving away. Dan Flynn, are you there? Dan Flynn, Dan Flynn. <laughs> nope. All right, looks like Gabrielle Walker is our next person for the t-shirt. But I mean, if you already have one of these things, well, on the off chance that you already have them, you can request one like one of the other things. Um, and Gabrielle Walker, email me for your, you are here. And then it looks like Kevin Hall is winning the dice. Cool. The dice. Kevin the dice. Hall, are you there? 
if we're not, we're going to have to pick somebody else. We're going to have to keep on handing that. I like that people are asking for the swag store. I think we finally are getting to the point where we have like enough cool swag that it's time to have our own store. <laughs> Mike says, Kevin died, but you can send them to me. <laughs> send them to me instead. <laughs> okay. Um, can you send me the book real quick? Uh, as well one last thing uh, we talked about this last oh, week oh, sending book over there all right so black hat how many books i think we're sending like 400 books to so many hat. it feels so like a books. million um so here's what's going to happen if you're at black hat or you're at defcon we did not get a table at black hat and defcon and well i'm going to be at a table i'm at the security weekly table at defcon but go see him uh, yeah that's just it's hit or miss folks it's it's defcon um <laughs> it's a crazy crazy so, world I am going to be rock, walking around with a backpack and every day. And my backpack is going to have like 50 of these books. And we will be announcing where I am. It'll be like a hallway outside of a room. Watch his Twitter. Yep, watch my Twitter. Strange um, JS. Yep, Strand JS, like a pack mule, exactly. Like a pack uh -huh. mule. And so Derek says, use Strava so he can hunt me down. And he, he follows me on Strava Ew. too. So I will be handing these books out. We won't have a table, but I'll basically be like, John's outside of the um, Augustus room. And as soon as I'm out of books, I am going to pack up and leave and we'll move to another location. So every day I'm going to be doing a location, a randomized location. Um, and maybe some vendors that we like. Uh, they like, say you'll get swarmed in no time. I have no problem with that. In fact, every out. time we've done this, we've gotten into trouble. We did it at the Tenable booth. A number of years ago when the book we first like came to live out. on the edge and all the vendors around Gorilla us marketing. got mad they were just like what would you shut Sorry. off the access to my booth by bringing us Brian hundreds says of people. all you're doing is rewarding stalkers that's okay <laughs> that really doesn't bother me all that much we'll sit down and we'll have a chat if you stalk me um but no we do get in trouble from vendors whenever we do this sans we had a bunch of vendors got really 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 mad because you had that line that went around the corner um sans. at one time uh, anyway. sans was fine with it sans the vendors that were complaining, Sands were like, so you're complaining about John bringing hundreds of people in Man, front of your booth. We have people that are on their vacation this week joining our webcast. Yeah. You guys are the best. Yeah. Well, thank you. Come see us later. Let's, um, let's shut join it down. for part four later this month, but I will send you all the emails because apparently I don't send enough emails. Um, I think we should take the marketing team out for sushi now. What do you think? I think that's a good idea. We would take you if you were here, but you're not, ha. Huh? So we're going to go without you. But thanks for joining, and we'll have another webcast next week. And happy 4th of July. See you, everybody. Bye.